Thank you. Thank you everyone for, for attending today. It is an honor to give an introduction uh, today at the inaugural Black History Month lecture at the Brain Research Institute Joint Seminars in the Neuroscience Series. Um, uh, uh, the speaker and I prior to coming here was just, were just talking about how great of a, it is an, of an idea um, to start this Black History Month lecture. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Um, our speaker received his undergraduate degree at Lagos University in Lagos, Nigeria, um, after which he came west across the Atlantic to the University of Alabama to conduct graduate research in the area of molecular and cell biology. During that time, he made seminal contributions to development of the fruit fly as a model for Parkinson's disease. After completing his doctoral training in 2008, he went further west again to pursue his postdoctoral training at a humble California university that's quietly nestled in the Westwood neighborhood of Los Angeles. I think many of the people here may be familiar with it. Um, there, under the guidance of Dr. David Krantz, our speaker went on to study dopaminergic sig signaling mechanisms in the fruit fly, again, um, taking advantage of uh, that uh, uh, um, uh, model as a model of Parkinson's disease. Um, in 2013, our speaker left his postdoc here at UCLA and accepted a faculty position at Delaware State University, which is a historically black university located in Dover, Delaware. During his time there at uh, Delaware State University, Dr. Akeem Lawalis continued his pioneering work in the fruit fly, um, some of which he will present to you today. And uh, last year, Dr. Lawal was appointed as a adjunct professor here in the Department of Neurobiology at UCLA. Um, my experience with Dr. Lawal has been a very fruit, fruitful one. He, I know him through, through his work as a professor at UCLA, but through his work here at the Brain Research Institute with uh, several of our summer pipeline programs. He has been, he had partnered with our pipeline programs soon after my, our arrival here. Him being at an HBCU, Delaware State, he was started out as our uh, as our HBCU partner at Delaware State, and his role has evolved and 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 grown since then. He's not only been instrumental to the success of these programs, but more importantly, he has leveraged that success by enhancing the footprint of neuroscience at Delaware State. There, he's had several accomplishments um, of which he, uh, our, his partnership at UCLA has, has been a part. He and Dr. Felix Schweitzer, the director of the Brain Research Institute here, have co-taught a neuroscience course together at Delaware State. And through Dr. Wall's own success, grant funding, and his role as vice chair of biological sciences, he has successfully translated um, a lot of the work he's done here and a lot of the work we continue to do together um, which has been an assistance to him, not, not solely because of his relationship with UCLA, but he has used it to cultivate our field at Delaware State, a valued HBCU partner. Um, he, is, he has helped neuroscience grow there. Um, so he, he embodies the goal of, of our partnership and many of the goals of, of the BRI, which is if we want to enhance neuroscience and we want to attract neuroscience, we want to attract the best and brightest trainees from underrepresented populations then we have to bring neuroscience to underrepresented populations. And Dr. Lawal is doing that in a really big way. I'm here to present a talk entitled All in the Head, Synapting Neurotransmission Relevant to Aging and Parkinson's Disease. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Akeem Lawal. Uh, thank, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paul, for that introduction. Um, uh, my colleague had asked me what, uh, what's this building here, and I'll just tell you it's our research center at Delaware State University. We call it the shiny building uh, for obvious reasons, um, but it's a nice place to go if you want to look, see what you look like uh, on a typical day. So uh, but we like it. It's pretty landmark and on campus there. So I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. I've been so excited about this talk. I have to tell you that um, if I sound a little nervous and jittery, it's my excitement talking. <laughs> And you're gonna you're gonna see that in the coming uh, in the coming slides. So um, to serve as sort of like a roadmap uh, through this presentation, I, I want to share like three stories. I'm gonna be talking today, uh, three three broad themes, uh, if you will. The first one is uh, celebrating Black excellence. So the 
the, the whole point of a Black History Month. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And I will talk about four outstanding individuals um, whom exemplify um, what we are talking about when we talk about Black History Month. From there, I'll segue to my own research uh, with two uh, broad themes. Because of the structure of the presentation today, I won't go into a lot of detail about what we do uh, in the lab, but I hope to kind of show you some vignettes about uh, our work with the dopaminergic synapse, much of which started uh, right here at UCLA uh, under the mentorship of uh, Dr. David Krantz, who I, I'm so thankful for both his, uh, his mentorship and just the fact that he's a wonderful person. And finally, I'll tell you about our work with the cholinergic synaptic signaling, which constitutes about 60% uh, of the research we do in the lab. So um, it's very important for me to emphasize that uh, when we're talking about celebrating Black History Month, uh, it, it's, it's two things. There are two goals with the Black History Month celebration. The first one is the celebration itself, right? To talk about the contributions of African-Americans and Black people to, to community, to scholarship, to our progress as a nation and indeed the world. The second goal is also as important, and it's, it's that Black History Month serves as a corrective um, for a lot of unfortunate reasons, uh, some of which you will see in the course of my slides uh, preceding, um, following this one. The contributions of African-Americans have not been celebrated and frankly um, have been ignored in some respects. And so a Black History Month serves as a way to correct that. And it, it serves as a legacy of uh, Dr. Carter G. Whitson, who, uh, who started uh, Black History Month as ne Negro History Month in 1926. He's an alum of, uh, of the University of Chicago and a Harvard trained historian. And you're not gonna believe the irony of this because when he started this idea of a Negro History Month, his goal was to integrate the contributions of African-Americans into the broader curriculum for the K through 12 education. How amazing it is that these days, in 1921, 1922, um, there are pitched battles about the contributions, um, parts of which include African-Americans in the curriculum for um, students in the K through education. So it just shows you, first of all, the, the, the foresight of Dr. Woodson about a hundred years ago. And also the fact that we've made a lot of progress, but more work needs to be done. So along those lines, um, serving as the two parts so to keep that in mind, the two part to go, which is the corrective and the celebration. I wanna talk about the contributions of Solomon Carter Fuller. And you're probably wondering, wait, this does not look like an African-American. Uh, you're probably right, because this is Dr. Alois Alzheimer. He is a legend in our field, right? Because as you might imagine, Alzheimer, the disease Alzheimer's came from um, his discovery. So he's the first person to describe Alzheimer's disease. He's a, he was a German uh, psychiatrist and neuroanatomist. Um, and, and he made seminal contributions to the field there, to the point that we still talk about him today. Now, the person you probably may not know as much of is Solomon Carter Fuller. And when I saw this article about a year ago in the Washington Post, I was just blown away, okay? Because get this, he is the first African-American neurologist. He's actually believed to, the, to be the first African-American psychiatrist um, in, in the country. And he trained with Alzheimer. In fact, um, uh, Louis Alzheimer put out the call and uh, he was one of five foreign uh, graduate research assistants um, that went to work directly with Alzheimer uh, in the University of Munich in 1904. After completing that graduate of, of scholarship, Fuller returned to the United States. And what really caught my attention was the fact that he discovered neurofibrillary tangles. So for a little bit of background and all of the um, Alzheimer's disease aficionados in the house who probably um, most certainly will be very familiar with this. Uh, there are two pathological hallmarks for Alzheimer's disease, right? The, there's the neurofibrillary tangles that is comprised um, hyperphosphorylated um, uh, tau, it's inside the neuron. And then outside of the neuron, you have the extracellular deposit of uh, neuro, uh, this plaques called, uh, that are made up of this protein called A-beta-42. Well, Carter Fuller discovered the neurofibrillary tangles. I did not know this. And I have I've followed Alzheimer's research for more than a decade, right? And so 
Um, not only that, but he was the first person to publish the first comprehensive review on the disease and made several other seminal contributions, including this, the discovery of miliary plaques, another pathological hallmark of the disease. I wish I could tell you that um, after these seminal discoveries, um, Dr. Fuller got a, his, his face carved on the uh, neuroscience equivalent of Mount Rushmore, but that did not happen. In fact, um, he left Boston University, retired under um, circumstances that were clouded in discrimination, unfortunately. And this is a direct quote from uh, Dr. Fuller. With the sort of work I have done, he said of his retirement from Boston University, I might have gone further and reached a higher plane had it not been for the color of my skin. And I remind you that this was in the 50s, right? So uh, again, it just reminds us of opportunities to celebrate um, excellence of those that have come before us. The second story I wanna tell you is no less fascinating. In fact, if I thought I was riveted by the story of Dr. Fuller, I was absolutely mesmerized by this one. So come with me for a minute. Let me tell you about um, this enslaved person by the name of Onesimus and his contribution, as you can see from this article in the local affiliate of uh, NBC, um, how an enslaved man helped battle Boston um, um, helped Boston battle devastating disease 200 years ago. Now, initially I thought, well, this has to be, uh, you know, a rhetorical device, perhaps this is a hyperbole. Well, it turns out that it's very far from a hyperbole. The story is actually far more interesting um, than even the headline has here. But so, for first, some historical context is in order. So let me situate this um, event in, in the chronological timescale, both with respect to the history as we know it, but also our journey towards vaccination, right? So this is about um, 1721, uh, I'm in the red uh, font here, uh, approximately 101 years after the Mayflower, right? So the, so the pilgrims had come, they had landed in Plymouth Rock and a different part of uh, Massachusetts. It's about 55 years before the Revolutionary War. And um, about 75 years before uh, Edward Jenner's discovery of uh, vaccination, right? His first experiment, like what we understand as evidence based uh, um, research, right? And then um, another 230 years or so before uh, Jonas Salk's um, polio vaccine. I'm going to all this detail to just help you to appreciate the magnitude of the contribution of this um, enslaved person. So the story unfolds like this. There was a historic um, um, uh, episode of smallpox raging in Boston. Okay, it's so serious that when I looked in the Harvard Medical School archive, this is what I found. Um, you can see the font here. Um, the, uh, the, the mortality rate from that bout of smallpox was 8%. So that might not sound like a big number, but consider that COVID-19 in the United States, the case fatality rate is approximately 1.2%, right? It's higher in other parts of the country, lower in the Asian countries, et cetera, some Asian countries, et cetera. But 8% is eight out of 100 people I mean, the city was in panic for, right, for the right reasons, right? So it's in this background that you can imagine that people will do anything and everything to just end this epidemic, okay? So I wanna introduce another character here by the name of um, Reverend Cotton Matter. Reverend Matter, um, and I wanna quickly uh, just um, give a warning here that some of the language I might use in the next couple slides or so, um, might be triggering to some, some persons. And I, I wanna be respectful uh, for those that have come before us. So it's possible that I might use language that some might not find um, uh, as easy to listen to, okay? So I wanna, I wanna be, be, be very uh, clear and give you that, that heads up. So Reverend Mather, um was the owner, if you will, of Onesimus at this time. And he saw this article, remember there's a, there's a raging um, epidemic out there. And he saw this article in the Royal Society, and I, I actually saw the paper when I was doing the research for this. And it was the story of a, of a person who lived in Constantinople. Constantinople um, is modern day Istanbul. At, at the time it was in the Ottoman Empire, right? So it was, it, this person had been in Constantinople and he was writing to the Royal Society that there's this procedure called inoculation. And this inoculation was practiced in, in China and, and I believe in India as well. And that person was just describing it and said, the person gets uh, a postule of the smallpox, in, uh, kind of like ex um, exposed to, to their arm or something, and they don't get smallpox after that, right? 
And so the reverend is writing back and saying, I agree with you. And then I quote, he says, he described the operation to me. By he, he's talking about Onesimus and said, and showed me in his arm. So he's showing evidence, the scar which it had left upon him. Okay, so, so this enslaved person is delivering a testimony to the reverend to tell him that this thing called vaccination, um, I'm sorry, inoculation actually uh, happened, okay? And then, um, and I'm, I'm gonna go further and, and say that. So, so, so the reverend goes in that Royal Society letter and says, um, my enslaved person, so I put dot, dot, dot there, Onesimus, who is a pretty intelligent fellow, emphasis mine, whether he had, I asked him, basically it was what he was saying, whether he had ever had the smallpox. And he answered both yes and no. And then told me that he had undergone an operation which had given him something of the smallpox and would forever preserve him from it. And I was like, wow. So if you're thinking, wait, this sounds like vaccination. I'll say, yes, you would be right. It's called, it was called inoculation at the time. And it was being described by an enslaved person by the name of Onesimus. Okay, so there are so many threads here to go with. First of all, uh, and this person originally originated, uh, was supposed to have been from West Africa, although I read some sources that said he might have come from somewhere in modern day Libya. Uh, but so I'm originally from West Africa, right? Like um, Dr. Paul had mentioned. So it was very interesting to me that 300 years ago, there was a technology in West Africa that was that proven to save lives in the community at the time, right? I didn't know that. But I wanna stick with two um, um, uh, points for the purposes of this talk, right? And I actually also included a reference here for anyone who's interested, uh, you can find it on PubMed. So there are two takeaways of many that I want to emphasize. The first one is the description by Reverend Matter of um, this uh, enslaved person, uh, uh, Onesimus. He describes him as a pretty intelligent fellow who answered in a very intelligent way, right? This is a very, and I'm thinking about well, this is such a smart way to answer. Have you ever had smallpox? Yes or no? Well, how about yes and no, right? And so, 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 and I, and I really kind of, this spoke to me because it's very difficult maybe for us to imagine life back 300 years ago, right? But if you just take a minute to imagine the life of an enslaved person, right? Um, the intellectual foundation of slavery, if you will, was the idea that enslaved people were not people, right? There were, there were virulent variations of this thinking and there were also less than virulent version, but it all came to the same thing. That some, a, a particular group of individuals were not people, right? And so that was used to justify a lot of different um, realities at the time. But here is Reverend Matter, 130 years, 33 years to be precise, before the Civil War would, would abolish, would help lead to the abolition of slavery, essentially declaring the institution um, really, um, uh, 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 essentially questioning the validity of the institution by declaring an enslaved person, a pretty intelligent person who's helping to fight smallpox. The second point, uh, no less important that I want to emphasize here before we leave this page is the perspective of Onesimus himself. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a lot of literature on him, right? Other than some of these that I was able to identify here. But I want you to consider for a second the perspective of an enslaved person in 1721. You're not considered human. And, and it's, it's difficult to say that today, but that was the reality at the time. And yet here he was delivering a technology, a testimony that would save hundreds, thousands of lives, right? And in fact, uh, as a scientist, we would call this kind of testimony a proof of concept, right? If you can show evidence that this stuff works, Okay, then is what we, we can do a little bit more uh, uh, along those lines. So that was basically what, um, what Onesimus was, was doing here. And, and I, I mean, the story is so fascinating. It goes on and on that um, Reverend Mara actually took risks as well. Um, somebody firebombed apparently his residence or something or one of the people who were carrying out this campaign. He was very controversial at the time. As you can imagine, even 2021, we're still fighting over vaccines, right? So you can imagine what was going on 300 years ago. So here he is, um, that corrective, okay? And the celebration on this page of a person that unfortunately we don't have enough information uh, about. 
but whose contribution is no less important uh, in the way we live our lives today. And it's along that, those lines uh, that I wanna move on to the next slide. And I'll just leave us with this thought about this uh, person that I will submit to you that the decision of Onesimus to deliver a testimony that would help fight uh, a, an outbreak is a, a, a distillation of the Amer African-American spirit. And it's this, loving and caring for a country and a people that do not love you back in any meaningful way, right? And, 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 and you, can, you can just run a through line through generations of African-Americans who have done seminar work like this, some in big ways, some in ways that are not as big as others, but the same spirit runs through this group of people um, for the betterment of a society that struggles, frankly, to reciprocate uh, the same love and fealty and loyalty uh, to these people. So a couple more examples along those lines, and I'm not gonna go further than UCLA itself, right? And I actually have to thank, and I'm, I'm so glad to see Dr. Portera on this call because, uh, because he, he taught me this. <laughs> I was at UCLA for years. I, I was a postdoc at UCLA, like Dr. Uh, Dr. Paul said. Um, I passed the Bond Center dozens of times. I used to go running around the circuit, right? It's about a 4.4 mile um, um, uh, uh, circuit if you want to do a run and then a couple of times or whatever. Um, and I would pass the Bond Center. Little did I know that this was a legend, right? So, so, so just uh, a couple of points, there's so many of them, but in the interest of time, he was a UCLA alum, so go Bruin, right? Um, he served in World War II. He was a veteran of the war and, and he didn't just serve in World War II, right? He served what we call, uh, what's called the Office of Special Services, the precursor to the CIA, as I, as I, as I understand um, that uh, office at the time, OSS. He was also a diplomat that helped to form the United Nations. And he was the first uh, black Nobel laureate and he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his mediation efforts in the Arab-Israeli conflict of the late 1940s. And this is one that cracked me up when I saw it on the Nobel Peace Prize website. This is a Nobel laureate website, right? And here's what they said. His grandmother, an indomitable woman who appeared Caucasian in parentheses on the outside, but was all black fever parentheses on the inside, took Ralph and his two sisters to live in Los Angeles. And, you know, and, 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 you know, if you're a black person kind of reading this, you just kind of laugh a little bit that, you know, <laughs> description of, <laughs> of a person with fervor. But, 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 you know, but it, within that conversation though, I want to make a very important point, which we see firsthand at the HBCU side. It's this idea that blackness comes in all colors. Okay, so, so what we would call a black person who appeared Caucasian is called white presenting, like it's what we call that. And then and across all different shades and colors and it's an embodiment of all kinds of experiences. And it's so interesting that this is being described, um, uh, Ralph Bond's um, and family is being described in this way. And finally, before we leave um, uh, this, this uh, um, uh, part of the talk, I wanna talk about this present day. And I want to credit Miss um, Patricia Lowe for, for sharing some of these resources with me. Uh, and and it's, 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 it's right here on the UCLA campus, Dr. Gil Wyatt, who is the first person of color to be named full professor uh, at the David Geffen School of Medicine uh, um, uh, uh, in South Campus. And then uh, she was also a HBC alum. We're going to talk about that momentarily. And the first black licensed psych psych psychologist in, in the state of California. And what I love about this um, story about her, which was actually found in the UCLA Health, is that she credited her Jewish colleagues at UCLA for helping her prepare for her licensure examinations and to become a psychologist. And I, and I was just thinking that, wow, what, what an embodiment of, of, of experiences um, in, the, in, in, the, in the medical research community. And I, I could be the one saying this, right? Because I've been trained and, and have benefited and I've been helped along. By, by colleagues who are Jewish, who are Chinese American, who are Asian American, South Asian American, I mean, and, 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 and the people from Latino backgrounds and Latin A backgrounds. It, it's just such an experience to, to bring all of that together uh, into the experience of, that all of us share as African Americans and those who consider uh, uh, ourselves allies of African Americans. So finally, I cannot talk about the HBCU, uh, the, the African-American experience without talking about HBCUs. So back to that story earlier on, 
um, of Onesimus and the time of slavery, there was a very interesting problem that, that came up after slavery. And it was this, for centuries, uh, enslaved persons were not allowed to get an education, right? And so what happens, 1865, right? The war is won, um, black people are free. Okay, then what? What happens after that, right? There's, there's, there are millions of people who are not educated because of these systemic uh, strictures that had been put in place. So the 1891 land grant institutions came as a way uh, in fairness to the government to try to solve that problem. And it's called the Morial Act, it's the second Morial Act. And it led to the establishment of many HBCUs, okay? And from that time, I, I, I'm just gonna quote two statistics in the interest of time to, to, to help you appreciate the magnitude of the impact of these institutions as a cultural icon in this country. So 3% of colleges and universities in the United States are HBCUs, about just a little by 100 of them. But 27% of African-American students with degrees in STEM, bachelor's degrees to be precise, came from HBCUs. So you're looking at an 800% um, increase above the representation of these institutions um, in the United States. Here's another one that also kind of um, I found very stunning. Approximately 10% of American undergraduates, African-American undergraduates attend HBCUs. Yet more than a third of undergraduates who go on to PhDs um, went to HBCUs. So you're looking at three and a half times um, more above the number that these um, uh, um, um, institutions are kind of like taking. So, you know, and, and you know, like, a lot of you are probably, you know, natural skeptics like me. You might be wondering, okay, yeah, maybe you're just handing degrees or something. Well, it turns out that these graduates from HBCUs end up going to do great and mighty things, right? Um, Dr. Paul, who just introduced me, uh, is one example. Dr. Wyatt, that I talked about in the last slide, went to a HBCUs, and um, our vice president uh, is a proud HBCU alum. So that just t tells you that these institutions. Not only are they iconic in terms of the history of the country, but they are doing, uh, they are punching way above their weight to, to, to fill this gap that still exists in the country today. And then as an exemplar of the HBCU is my primary uh, affiliation, uh, Delaware State University. We began with seven students who were formerly enslaved persons in, in, in that 1891. And um, by, by 2021, their enrollment was up to 7,500. So you can see how many. Um, magnitude, uh, the magnitude of, of, of the increase uh, is, is apparent here. We have a neuroscience program, um, some of which um, Dr. Paul was telling you about that I, I have a collaboration with, with Dr. Schweitzer that we try to do uh, a joint neuroscience lectures with UCLA is an example of that. We graduate students regularly uh, with PhDs, with, with, with masters and, and, and um, uh, undergraduate degrees as well. And, 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 and it just shows you the heavy lift uh, that these institutions do. And I have to also, mention another piece of information. These accomplishments are despite the dismal funding uh, climate that institutions like HBCUs have been subjected to. Um, in fact, I have to quickly point out that at one point I was at an NSF panel and when the, so uh, usually at these panels, some big shot comes to talk to us, you know, to tell your time is valuable, thank you for doing this, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, they said that, we don't like the, the, the disparity in this in the funding uh, for these kinds of institutions. So it's a recognition, it's a recognized challenge, even at the national level. So I'm going to end this part of the talk uh, by saying that all of the things I've discussed right now just gives you a sense of the, the treasure, right? That African Americans are to the country, but also the institutions um, that they've helped develop and uh, continue to build um, are also uh, important to the country as well. So all of these actually then sets up a, some kind of a tension though, if you're a, a researcher from a minoritized background. And the tension is this, on the one hand, you have these historical, um, frankly, um, um, uh, accomplishments that become a, for lack of a better word, it's uh, a responsibility on you, right? So you have talked about Fuller, I've talked about on Seamus, I've talked about Ralph Bunch, these are giants that have come before you. And then there are these problems of underrepresentation, 
You can't just fold your hands and say, okay, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. No, you've, you've got to step up. On the other hand, though, you have the fact that I just want to do science, right? A lot of, like many of you, I wake up in the middle of the night thinking, oh my gosh, what's going on with the synaptic transmission? Oh, oh, that experiment is not working, right? It's just, just kind of like you have nightmares. Sometimes you have great dreams. Very rarely you have beautiful dreams about your research. But either way, you are, you are consumed by your work, right? So there's this tension there. How, what do you do? And the way I've resolved to, to deal with that is I'm going to follow my passion. I love science. I love this rational inquiry into nature, trying to understand the molecular world, right? I'm going to do that first. And then the platform I build, to the extent that I make any success, I will use that to bring other people with me to, 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 to accomplish and help to lead the next generation to a better world in which we have greater representation in the interest of inclusive excellence, right? That's the whole idea. We want to do great work, regardless of whatever background we're coming from. So come with me uh, on that journey as I tell you about the work that goes on in my lab. So we use Drosophila um, to study um, neuroscientific questions. And a lot of people ask me why flies. And I joke and say that because flies can read newspapers better than people. It's not very true. It's mostly um, made up stuff, but we can train flies to do a lot of really surprising things. Uh, and many of you on this call can attest to the fact that Drosophila make excellent research systems genetic um, systems in ways that you probably wouldn't be able to do in many other uh, model organisms. And then uh, more importantly though, is that they have a very conserved um, um, synaptic machinery and you're, and you're going to hear about this uh, momentarily. And there's a great track record in biomedical research using Drosophila. Many people have won Nobel prizes uh, with work in, in fruit flies. So, but let's talk about the, the machinery for a second, okay? And um, I love using this slide and I have to give credit to, to David Krantz who uh, he originally, he created the first slide like this. And you know, the joke is that you can tell David's trainee, right? Just ask them to show you a slide. If they can produce this, then they came from his lab. So, but, but I do love this slide a lot because the simplicity, it is, it's, it's, it's elegance. So let's talk a little bit about the dopaminergic synapse for a minute. And you have this molecule called dopamine, right? The lay term to describe dopamine is that it's a happy drug, right? You, you feel great, you know, you feel lovely, you know, you eat some beautiful food, all of that. It's the reward. It's the print, one of the primary neurotransmitters in the world pathway, right? However, there's a dark side to dopamine though. And it's this, if you have dopamine hanging around in the, in the, intracell, uh, in the presynaptic neuron, just floating around there, it does really terrible things. It can burn up a cell, it can form conjugates with other compounds and really, really do a lot of damage. So in comes this transporter called the vesicular monoamine transporter or VMAX. And what it does is it basically mops up dopamine, packages it into the synaptic vesicles for extracellular uh, transport, right? So, um, what happens when that doesn't work well? In fact, one of the theories that we have for Parkinson's at least with respect to the dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra, is that um, a, a dysregulation of dopamine is actually killing those neurons. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about Parkinson's then as a result of that. It's the second most common neurodegenerative disease. Um, the loss of dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra is a pathological hallmark of Parkinson's. In other words, it's the one thing, one of the few things that you, if, if, you, if you see it, you know it's Parkinson's. Unfortunately, this usually, you can only ever tell this uh, definitively doing postmortems, right? And then uh, there are other characteristics, which is uh, oxidative stress that is caused by free cytosolic dopamine. And then there's no cure for Parkinson's. I do have to clarify here though, that I'm not saying that uh, Parkinson's disease is a dopaminergic neuron disease. That would be wrong, right? In fact, the consensus is emerging that actually uh, the neuronal dysfunction is, is not the first thing that happens in Parkinson's. So a lot of other things happen starting from the guts uh, uh, the, uh, abnormalities in the gut, uh, uh, sleep, loss of sleep, loss of smell, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the context that allows us though to study Parkinson's, the idea that dopamine is involved, even though it's not the only game in town. And so we use Drosophila to study Parkinson's. Well, we're working on the shoulders of giants, right? If you will. And I'll start by um, acknowledging Melfini's work. Uh, she's still at Harvard. Uh, she published this paper about 22 years ago. And it's the first um, 
demonstration of Drosophila as a Parkinson's disease model. She was able to recapitulate a lot of the hallmarks of Parkinson's disease in, in the fruit fly. If, if that sounds crazy to you, I, <laughs> it is. It's just a lot of exciting stuff. And then um, Nancy Bonini, um, working with uh, Virginia Lee and, and John Trojanowski, who, who passed away recently, um, helped, in fact, solidify these findings that in working independently of Melfini's group, they showed essentially the same thing. And then right here at UCLA, um, um, uh, Mingo published this. Uh, this was one of the first demonstration of an interaction between pink, pink one and parking um, in the context of Parkinson's disease. And, and, and all of these, uh, we call them familial Parkinson's because it's, it's about approximately 8% of cases and Parkinson's cases um, that are traced to, to genetic sources like, like this one that I've identified here. A lot more of Parkinson's disease is what we call sporadic. Another word for saying we have no idea what's going on. And along those lines, um, uh, said uh, Berman's uh, group at Bordeaux, they showed for the first time that you could use rotenone, uh, these environmental um, um, agents that actually is still being used in some places to, to kill fish. Um, and and it's, been, it's been linked to, to that sporadic Parkinson's disease I told you about. Um, so Dremel's group was able to recapitulate that in, in, in Drosophila. And our group uh, back in 20, 2007, when I was in um, a grad school with Janice O'Donnell, we showed this, uh, the same um, uh, modeling um, using paraquats. Okay, so it's, it's within this context that when I joined UCLA in 2007, um, 2008 rather, in David's lab, I, I, I joined at, at such an exciting time because uh, Marie-Francois Chesley was, uh, was heading this gigantic project, which we call the UCLA CJEP project. And the idea was this, to take advantage of the unique status of, uh, of UCLA as being situated in California. And California, many of you already know, is the breadbasket of the nation, right? That also means, though, that a lot of pesticide is used to generate the breadbasket. Okay. So, this project was centered around this idea that we can identify people who are more susceptible to Parkinson's, the environmental part of it rather, um, if we can follow them uh, over the last 30 years that they've existed. So, so California had this database that juxtaposed the use of pesticides with the, uh, um, the, the, the migration or, or lo lo localization uh, pattern of individuals. So, what I mean by that is that if you lived in, say, the Central Valley 30 years ago, right, you could identify how many pesticides were used at that time, uh, how much of it, the types of pesticides were used, and then you could go back and track that individual over time and see whether they developed Parkinson's or not. So there was this rich, like, panoply of data that came out of this study. And one of the, the, the nuggets of data that came out was that that protein I told you about, the vesicular monoamine transporter, it was found that there were individuals who lived in the Central Valley. Um, the, 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 the no surprising story is that if you lived in an area where a lot of specific type of pesticides are used, you have a higher chance of getting Parkinson's disease. Except those individuals, particularly women, who carry the variant of that vesicular monoamine transporter, that allowed it to be overexpressed. In other words, if you produce uh, more of this transporter, somehow there's a, there's a protection that confers on you against Parkinson's. Well, this was an epidemiological study, right? And so one question you could ask is, is it correlation or is it causation? Is it just a, a coincidence that people who have a lot of this uh, transporter protein that, that mops up dopamine are protected against Parkinson's or is there, is there something else going on? And in fact, that was what um, Dave's lab, the question that we set out to answer. And I wanna situate that back in the context of the schematic I showed you earlier on. So is this idea that dopamine is a happy drug, it does all those fun things that we talked about, but then it's also is capable of burning up the cell. So the question we were interested in in David's lab um, with the background of the epidemiolo epidemiological study uh, from, from the CJEP project was this, if we model Parkinson's disease by by introducing this chemical called rotenone, that's a risk factor for Parkinson's, um, for sporadic Parkinson's rather, um, could we um, ameliorate the toxicity that this rotenone could introduce by removing dopamine from the intracellular space through the increased action of the vesicular monoamine transport? 
And the resounding answer for of that project was yes. And this is published, so I won't go into all the details, but we were so excited to find out that we could, we could um, essentially recapitulate the epidemiological study that was done in the field. And so that kind of really brought a lot of excitement because the question then is, if we can find a way to somehow upregulate this transporter activity, perhaps we're looking at a possible treatment of, of some um, um, uh, aspects of Parkinson's. Just to remind you, there's a lot of premium here. As we speak, there's one at most two drugs to treat Parkinson's. And actually even the Cinemed, which is the most, most commonly prescribed ones has a lot of side effects. So there's no good drug basically to treat the, the disorder. So uh, intrepid um, group we were, we, we sought out to try to find that drug that we can use to, to treat, uh, to elevate the, the activity of that transporter with the idea that it's a potential treatment for Parkinson's disease. And I'm gonna describe the schematic for you here um, with a, with a, in about a minute or so. And then, and then, and then I, I, can, I can show you where we are right now. So I love um, talking about this, the way we designed this screen because it integrates a lot of the things I've been telling you earlier on. Um, the Drosophila as a model system, the beauty of neuroscience, right? The, the excitement of discovery, it just brings everything together in one slide. And so, so just stay with me for a second. Um, please don't fall asleep because this is genetics. Um, I promise I'm gonna do my best. So, so here's the deal. In a null mutant background, a null genetically it is defined as just a complete absence of gene product, right? So we have that in the lab. Uh, it's called the VMAT null. So there's no gene product. And if we use locomotion activity as a readout, if you take these flies that are mutants, um, homozygous mutants, they have almost no locomotor activity at all. Um, one of the ingenuity in David's lab was to create another background, which we call the weak expressor. I won't go into the details of how we did it, but the bottom line is that you introduce a, a, a small quantity genetically of wild type vesicular monoamine transporter gene into this non mutant background. And the, the beauty was that we're able to rescue, we call that term rescue, to increase locomotion activity by just a little bit, right? But that little bit was enough to be able to tell statistically that there were different um, genetic backgrounds. And the best part of it was this. We asked the question, can we modify these different backgrounds further using a psychoactive drug, right? So in this case, it's amphetamine, but we tried using cocaine as well. Um, we used amphetamine here and it was super exciting because we were able to amplify this difference between two genetic backgrounds using uh, the amphetamine drug. And so you can see here, this one is uh, the mutant background here that was already moving a little bit better, but then the difference just kind of just got uh, much, much more um, uh, prevalent. And so that told us that this was a screen that you can actually do. You can design a screen to essentially find other drugs that behave like amphetamine. Okay, so you're probably asking me, okay, why don't you just use amphetamine to treat Parkinson's, man, you know, problem solved. Well, the problem is that amphetamine does a lot of other stuff too, right? It facilitates what we call a non-regulated release um, of, of neurotransmitter and, and a bunch of other things that it makes it not a good target for, for treatment for Parkinson's. Anyway, so we designed a screen around this preliminary data, a pilot study that we found. And the big, um, you know, the big kind of thing at the time was this um, panel from the NIH, um, there's about 1,040 drugs. They were already FDA approved for other purposes. So it was just packaged as a tool of drug discovery. And so, you know, the joke was like, we're using, you know, old, old drugs, new tricks, right? Ha, 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 like old drugs, new tricks. And then um, we, we, but we found about seven out of these 1,000 drugs uh, that, uh, that came out of this screen as putative anti-Parkinson's agents. And we did some uh, validation studies uh, in Nigel Maidman's lab uh, using mammalian cultures of, of, of Parkinson's disease, which I won't show you the slides here, but I'm happy to talk about the Q&A. Um, and, then, and then, so we've, we've actually continued the work here and I wanna acknowledge the people. Uh, so, so we've continued doing that drug discovery work at Dell State. Um, Dion Williams here and Esther Abiona are the ones that are leading that project right now. Esther just graduated from the lab, but she was so talented that we had to try to bring her back as a consultant uh, to help out. And then uh, we are also looking for new models of Parkinson's. So we are combining com uh, common pesticides to test them. And finally, uh, we're developing uh, an alpha-synuclein model uh, for what we call the preformed fibrils. 
Um, so it's a great model to, and flies are great tools for, for genetic analysis. This is a great model for Parkinson's, so we're trying to unite both. So that essentially summarizes the Parkinson's work. For the rest of my talk, uh, the next maybe five, 10 minutes or so, I do wanna talk about our work in the cholinergic uh, release um, story. And I'll try to get through as much of this as, uh, as I can within the time, but there's a lot of fascinating stuff that I wanna share with you. So back to David's slide. <laughs> and this time, um, I'm not um, using the vesicular monoamine transporter, but we're using this transporter called the vesicular acetylcholine transporter. The difference is that now we're looking at the cholinergic synapse and not the dopaminergic synapse. So the differences apply. This is the choline transporter, which facilitates the re-entry of a precursor to acetylcholine. And then we have the acetylcholine receptor, which is uh, downstream of that. So we are interested in a number of questions in the lab. One of them is about structure function analysis, right? How is it that changes in this transporter can affect function? And then for the purposes of this talk, we're looking at questions about synaptic physiology. How do we modulate synaptic release and what's the effect uh, post-synaptic to that? And finally, we're trying to understand how normal aging unfolds as a way to hopefully develop uh, interventions that can slow down the, uh, the cognitive decline that is associated with aging. And again, to keep the theme of my talk, I want to acknowledge the people that came before me, Toshi Kitamoto, particularly because he helped me to start this project. When I was leaving uh, UCLA to start my lab, I reached out to Toshi because Toshi is the first person to publish um, um, uh, the paper on the vesicular acetylcholine transporter in, in flies. And I just said, hi, Toshi, you know, I'm looking at this project. I, was, I just wanted to pick your brain. And Toshi sends me like seven mutants. So for those of you who are not familiar, these are like unpublished stuff. He sent me reagents that he could publish like, I don't know, tens of papers out of. And he says, just go and, go and, go and advance the field. I want to see you succeed. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. And so we've stayed in touch ever since. And uh, Marco Prado and Vanilla Prado, who are based in Canada, uh, they, they are doing the vesicular um, transport, acetylcholine transport in mice. And so they've, they've advanced the field in that, in that, in that area. And we're, we're, call up with, we're kind of in constant communication to help to advance uh, the field. So the last star player I want to introduce to you here is our genetic uh, toolkit that we use in the lab. And I want to take a minute to, to describe it uh, because I want to do it justice, right? So in, in, in classical genetics, right, you, you have a diploid organism. So you have two copies of the same gene. Um, so, so all of us have two copies of a particular gene, right? Um, and and um, on the other side though, in our lab, so the, a wild type animal would have two copies of whatever you're interested in. So if we take the example of the vesicular acetylcholine transporter as an example, in our lab, we have mutants, which was provided to us by Toshi Kiramoto, um, that are what we call null mutants. So they have no gene product as far as we can tell. And then we have another set of mutants that they have some um, genetic activity, right? They have some gene um, uh, product which leads to some effect. But we call them strong hypermorphs because they are pretty sick and the transporter is not working properly and on and on and on. And then we have the moderate hypermorphs in the lab, which we we'll call them moderates because they're not anywhere as serious a mutation as this one or this one, but they are still pretty serious. On the other side of the ledger, we have strong overexpressors and weak overexpressors of the transporter. So you can make a lot of it or just a lot, but a little bit of a lot. Okay. And finally, we have what we call the partial rescues, which ex ex um, occupies this gray zone between the moderate mutants and the normal expression. It's still a mutant because it's not normal, but it is not quite as serious as the other ones. So what we use, we use this collection, we call it the genetic thermostat because we dial up and we dial down transporter expression as a way to modulate acetylcholine release. And then we ask all kinds of questions. Okay, relating to aging, synaptic physiology, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, so that's what I'm gonna kind of share with you for the rest of the presentation. I do wanna tell you that in Drosophila, acetylcholine is not used at the neuromuscular junction, which is very important because whatever findings we, we we're looking at, we're looking at the central synapses and not the NMJ. So, so let me share some of the data with you uh, on why we were very surprised by them. And I'm acknowledging uh, Dr. Shaol, who was a graduate student, a uh, PhD student in my lab at the time. She defended in 2020. And uh, Jessica Martinez was an undergraduate at the time. And what they found was that if you overexpress uh, the vesicular acetylcholine transporter, if you, if you disrupt 
um, acetylcholine signaling in a big way through an overexpression, you actually kill the flies pretty dramatically. So that was very surprising for us. That was the first shocker. The second set of data that was surprising, but this one slightly more predictable was that depending on how much of the underexpression of the transporter you do, you may or may not modulate lifespan. So for example, if you have this weak or what I call the moderate hypermorph, that doesn't have any effect on lifespan. But if you have the strong hypermorph or the norm mutants, then that really, really dramatically affects the lifespan of the animal. And then, on, and then we continue to locomotion activity. We found also very interesting results there. The more serious the mutation is, the more dramatic the effect you get on uh, behavioral uh, um, assays like locomotion. In fact, what was very surprising to us was that that moderate hypermorph actually had a, what we call a gain of function effect um, in there. And then when we went to the other side of the ledger, which was the overexpression, we found also very interesting results. And this one was that if you overproduce the transporter, you actually have an age dependent decline in, in locomotion activity. And that effect was the same, whether or not you looked at males in this case, or females in the second slide I'm showing you here. And so a couple of other uh, look, uh, behavioral analysis that I, I'm not showing you here, led us to conclude that if you either overproduce or underproduce um, vesicular acetylcholine transporter functionality, you're going to disrupt acetylcholine link behaviors. And so the current model that we're using in our lab we think is a set point model, which is that you have, the right, you have to have the right and the perfect balance of acetylcholine. Otherwise, either way, it's too much or too little, right? The Goldilocks principle uh, is fully in play here. And so the other question that is very intriguing to us, particularly in the context of Alzheimer's disease, is the, the uh, unraveling the contributions of cholinergic signaling in learning and memory. And we've got some preliminary data. We have some tools in the lab. So this is an antibody we developed and published some years back that allows us to study acetylcholine um, in the Drosophila equivalent of the mushroom body. So it's expressed very nicely in there. We can go in there to see what's happening. We can modulate activity and, and other kinds of uh, manipulations that allows us to, to study cholinergic signaling. And so I'm gonna go right to the assay here. So we're, we're studying learning and memory. And if you're wondering, wait, Drosophila can learn? Yes, they can learn and they can actually also remember stuff, you know? And um, this assay is so, is so funny. I don't have time to go into all the, all the thousands of jokes that we've made about this, but basically it's called courtship learning. So female flies, they mate just once and they learn from there that they're not interested in, in um, uh, um, mating the male again. The males on the other hand, try to, um, uh, mate right every time and then the females reject them. So our assay is measuring whether or not the males learn or get the message that the female is not interested. And it turns out that our mutants, uh, sorry, our overexpressors are very stupid. Okay, they never learn. They keep going to try to mate with the female. And not only that, but they don't remember that they're stupid, right? So that was really kind of very interesting for us. Um, it was kind of disappointing initially because we were expecting that overexpression would do like these great and mighty things and we used to treat, um, potentially used to treat learning and memory deficits, but we had the opposite effect. So uh, we, have a, we are working with a different uh, hypothesis now in the lab. So just to summarize as I close the talk, um, uh, this part of the talk is that we, we have a system in the cholinergic uh, signaling the software that we're using to understand both learning and memory and uh, the changes in uh, behavioral activity um, over the lifespan of the animal. All right, so then that sets up this conundrum that what's going on and how do we figure it out? And this is the one that I would argue is actually the most exciting stuff that we're doing in the lab right now. And I'll show you some hot off the press data for that effect. I want to acknowledge Sergey Grigoriev here uh, because he helped uh, bring electrophysiology to my lab. So we have our own rig and he's sitting at that right now. And it helps us to develop assays that we can use to measure synaptic release um, and, and, uh, and intrinsic uh, firing properties of, of neurons. So this is the data that he, uh, he generated and we're kind of trying to publish now. Um, it's very intriguing because we found out that in the pupa, so the stage just before the adults, um, the, the, um, this, the uh, extracellular postsynaptic current is just haywire. It's not coordinated at all. So we're very intrigued to find out why this is the case. And then he, for the purposes of our vesicular acetylcholine transporter work, he can, um, make those um, uh, depolarization events quiescent by using the, an inhibitor of the vesicular acetylcholine transporter called the um, and, and And finally, 
um, for the purposes of the aging project I told you about, uh, he generated some data that we've actually been chasing for the past two years. And it's simply this, if you, if you record um, action potential um, 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 firing, uh, propagation, initiation and propagation in a young fly versus a, a super old fly, so like a 60 day old fly, which is like really old, you get very different properties. And so we're trying to understand why is that the case? I mean, it's not surprising on, the, on one level, right? Because you have these differences in age, but what's going on uh, to those neurons, um, specifically projection neurons. And finally, um, this is the heart of the press data, a collaboration with Dr. Mira Fatap uh, in the neurobiology department at UCLA um, with dissection done in Dr. Donnelly's lab, where it is just showing that number one, we are able to, um, um, do in vivo electrophysiology. So this is an incredibly challenging technique that to my knowledge, um, there's a group at Harvard, uh, Rachel Wilson's that does it and her trainees, I believe, but a bunch of others um, have not been able to successfully do this. But Mira has recorded from three cells and you can see the action potential generation um, is different between the three. And if you look at the ramp um, current injection, uh, you can see the, the initiation of the action potential, the first one it differs in, in each of the three cells. So we have an assay here that we can use to ask that question about aging. And not only that, but manipulate the transporter using that thermostat that I told you about and ask uh, what happens to presynaptic release and intrinsic firing properties of those postsynaptic uh, neurons. Okay, so um, as I close this, I'll just mention a couple of other projects that are really exciting in the lab that we do. One of them is um, this idea to understand what is it about the transporter that allows it to do different properties? And how can we manipulate that uh, to ask questions about the function of, of the synaptic um, uh, release machinery, specifically with respect to how the transporter works, locate the translocates to where it needs to go um, and, and do all of the things that allows it to modulate acetylcholine. All right, so I wanna acknowledge um, uh, Dr. Bopana and uh, Sophia, who's a lab tech in the lab for the preliminary data that allowed us to start doing the structure function analysis. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the science here and come back to the, the black history um, uh, month story. And I wanna say a couple of things, which is that we've we had a lot of progress over the last two years, right? With respect to um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I want to offer both an encouragement and an admonition. Um, on the encouraging side, I wanna say that, you know, we're doing a great job, right? Um, you really just did uh, this amazing search, right, for diverse faculty. Um, on well, the admonition, though, I want to say that we have to be careful because uh, we have to brace for a backlash. Um, because in the, in the history of the United States, as many of you know, um, this is not the first time we've had this amazing um, progress in, in race relations. In fact, it started from the end of the Civil War. There was this 15-year period called the Reconstruction. That was followed by 80 years of violent backlash in some time. And then it was until the civil rights movement that we had this push, like the Civil Rights Act, the FHA Act, and all of that. And that was followed by another backlash and that continued low grade until Barack Obama's election. And what happened after Barack Obama's election? Here we are again today. So I want to say that we should keep our foot on the pedal toward progress, right? We should not relent. Um, seminars like this are a great example. Um, faculty recruitment and training that UCLA is doing are a great example. The UCLA HBC initiative are a great example. Um, it's worth it, okay, at the end of the day for, for us to continue to push along these lines. And I'll end with saying that, why are we doing this? Well, a pluribus uno, right? Out of many, we are one people. And ultimately from the example I said about uh, Dr. Wyatt earlier on, we're trained by many people. I'm a, I'm a classic example. And I know many of us can relate to that as well. So I'm gonna end here and thank all the members of my lab and all these people who have helped me to, um, to, to, to progress this far in my scientific journey. And I'll take questions. <laughs>